Tonight's lesson is on the subject of the Kohanu, that is the priest being defiled for dead relatives. Again, Tuesday night Torah lesson study from Leviticus chapter 21 verses one through four. And tonight's lesson is on this subject regarding the priest, the Kohanu, being defiled for dead relatives. It reads as thus, Leviticus chapter 21, verse one through four. And Yahweh said unto Moshe, speak unto the priest, the sons of Aharon, and say unto them, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people, but for his kin that is near unto him, that is for, for his mother and for his father and for his son and for his daughter and for his brother and for his sister, a virgin that is nigh unto him, which have no husband. For her may he be defiled, but he shall not defile himself, being a chief man among his people to profane himself. In verse one of Leviticus, of Leviticus 21, instructions in our lesson tonight are to the priest of the tribe of Levi, who are from the family of the high priest Aharon, on how they should not be ceremonially defiled by dead bodies. Because it says in verse one, and Yahweh said unto Moshe, speak unto the priests, the sons of Aharon, and say unto them, there shall be none defiled for the dead among his people. The Hebrew Aharonic priests were the only appointed priesthood on earth who were appointed to come into the holy place of Yah. This, this stringent instruction regarding the priesthood not to have contact with dead bodies in verse one was to illustrate the set apart special way of life that the priests were to maintain in all purity from all corruption. The corroding influence or the corroding process of bodily decay of the human body and death was looked upon by ancient Israelites as uncleanness. The uncleanness of death is evident by such features as a foul odor, the emergence of rotting flesh, the release of bodily waste, the appearance of maggot worms and other unclean parasites, et cetera, et cetera. In contrast, the priests were to perform duties in the sanctuary, which were required by the Torah to involve the utmost of personal cleanliness and personal hygiene. Because as representatives of the people of Israel before the holy presence of Yah, it was in Israel's best interest that the priests maintain their best appearance and smell in the presence of Yah. For instance, in Exodus chapter 30, verse 17 through 21, as you can look at in your scriptures, the instruction is given for the continual ritual cleansing of the priest. Verse 17 through 21 of Exodus 30 says, And Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Thou shalt also make a lever of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash with it. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar and thou shalt put water therein. For Aharon and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. When they go in into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto Yahweh. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. A priest defiled by contact with a dead body would be greatly limited in his role 
as being an effective representative for Israel before the presence of Yah in the sanctuary, due to having had exposure to the defilement of a dead body. The ritual purity of the priest, who, like anyone else, he was still nonetheless an imperfect sinner saved by grace. But nonetheless, in spite of his imperfection, his ceremonial role as a priest was to be a shadow of a perfect and undefiled priesthood that was to come in the future, who is none other than Yeshua, the Messiah of the priestly order of Melchizedek, who, as the name Melchizedek means, is the true high priest, king of righteousness and peace. However, however, in verses two and three of Leviticus 21, Yahweh makes provision for the priest to manage the burial of the remains of near family only. Verse two and three says, but for his kin that is near unto him, that is for his mother and for his father and for his son and for his daughter and for his brother, and for his sister, a virgin that is nigh unto him, which have no husband. For her may he be defiled. This instruction about near relatives remains being handled by priest family members is to illustrate that the Levitical priests themselves are not the fullness of a pure priesthood, but they only serve as models of a priesthood to come in the person of Yeshua HaMashiach. According to Leviticus 21, verse 10 through 11, only the appointed high priest is not to handle any dead body, even a parent. This is obviously due to the fact that as high priest, he most represented the model of the righteousness of the priesthood of Yeshua more than the other priests. And as such, in spite of his own imperfections, his role as high priest required a more stringent set of laws than the other priests in order to better illustrate the righteousness of the priesthood of Yeshua. According to verse four of Leviticus 21, the office of the Levitical priesthood's restriction of managing the remains of dead bodies is cited as being due to the fact that the priesthood itself represented a chief man among the Israelites. Verse four says, but he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people to profane himself. That phrase, chief man, cited in verse four, that the Levite priest represented is that great high priest himself after the order of Melchizedek, Yeshua HaMashiach. From this lesson tonight on the sanctity of the Levitical priesthood and only dealing with the remains of near relatives or as the high priest who doesn't deal with any body's remains at all, we can, clean, we can glean some incredibly important spiritual meaning from these laws in chapter 21. Primarily that the sanctity of the priesthood is due to them being a sign of the chief man, cited in verse four, which is a reference to Yeshua HaMashiach. And therefore they are instructed, he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people or being a representative of the chief man who is coming, the master Yahshua himself. The chief man is Yahshua. In some regards, the Levitical priesthood function as types and shadows of the priesthood of Yahshua. As such, their stringent way of ministry was to illustrate and testify of this holy set apart ministry of our great high priest, Yeshua the Messiah. Though his ministry is after the order of a high priesthood, 
than the uh, Levitical priest. Yet Yeshua's high priesthood is higher than the Levitical priest because in Psalm 110, it states in verse four, Yah have sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As verified in Hebrews chapter six, verse 20, Psalm 110.4 is referring to Yahshua. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 20 verifies this where it states, wherefore or whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Yahshua, made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in review of this law in Exodus 21 of the Levitical priesthood, not to handle or be defiled by a dead body, it's clear that this is another feature of the role the priesthood portrayed as examples of the priesthood of Yahshua. And though the rest of the priests were allowed to manage near relatives' remains, the high priest could not, which means there is a priesthood that is superior than the priesthood of the other Levites. This was to illustrate that Yahshua's priesthood is superior over all other priesthood. The Levitical priests were to illustrate to Israel through their ministries, the ministry of Yahshua HaMashiach. But also in their portrayal of the ministry of Yahshua, Leviticus 21 verses one through four shows that their ministry of portraying the priesthood of Yahshua was nonetheless portrayed as inferior to the actual undefiled and perfect priesthood of Yahshua, due to the fact that other than the high priest, the other priests were defiled with the management of dead relatives. In Zechariah chapter three, the high priest in Israel, after the 70 year exile in Babylon, was himself named Yahshua, which incidentally is also the name of the true high priest himself, Yahshua HaMashiach, after the order of Melchizedek. Now the, the Levitical high priest Yahshua was told in Zechariah chapter three, verse seven through 10, as you turn to your scripture, this priest whose name incidentally is also Yahshua, he's, he is uh, being told by Yah in Zechariah chapter three, verse seven through 10, that he and the other priests were to be wonders, or in Hebrew, the Hebrew word is mafet, Hebrew uh, number 4159 Strong's Concordance, which means to be a sign or portent of things to come, which is referring to the role of the Levitical priesthood as portraying the coming Melchizedek priesthood, which is called, and who is called the branch in Zechariah chapter three, verse eight. So that Yah says to Joshua, the Levitical high priest in Zechariah 3, 7, thus said Yah of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Yahushua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at, for they are men who are signs or portents. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I've laid before Yahshua, Yahoshua. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, said Yah of hosts and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, said Yah of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the tree fig tree. So to really emphasize this part, point, that the historic Levitical high priest, Yahshua, the son of Yehoshadak, who was the priest in Israel around 530 BC, he was a sign of the coming greater priest, or the Hebrew word Moffat, 
that's used in verse seven. Uh, and, and, and that was to illustrate that his priesthood was simply a model of a greater priest who is called the branch in, in the description we just read in, in the book of Zechariah, verses seven through 10. And that this, this high priest that was known in the time of 530 BC, his name was Yehoshua, the son of Jehoshaphat. He was born with the name of the coming high priest king, Yahshua HaMashiach, who would come around 500 years later. Hallelujah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 9 through 15, further expounds this point of the high priest, Yahshua, being Yehoshadak. Now, they have his name listed in your Bibles as Joshua, but as you know, Joshua is really Yahshua, and in the long firm, Yahushua. So that he is a man who's a priest who's functioning, as it was taught in Leviticus 21, verse 1 through 4, to be a model of the chief man, which is Yahshua himself. And so this, this priest, Yahushua being Yehoshadak, is very special. And his priesthood was around the year 530 BC in Jerusalem. And, and uh, he was very special to denote the coming high priesthood of a greater priest, just like the priest in the sanctuary in the times of Moshe functioned in the tabernacle sanctuary, and they were given instructions about how they would carry themselves. In that case, uh, in chapter 21 of Leviticus, it was regarding their procedure of matching dead bodies of relatives, which is not a pleasant thing to uh, talk about, but it is something that was a reference point how that the coming Messiah is greater than them because the Messiah, the greater priest who's coming, he could touch a dead body and make it come back to life. He could open up graves and bring the dead out of graves. He could take what's unclean and make it clean. None of these priests had that power, but there's a greater priest that got that power over life and death. And until he came, they had regulations, those priests, to illustrate that they themselves, as much as they aspire to be set apart holy, theirs could not approach this greater priest that's coming after the order of Melchizedek. A priesthood which involves this greater priest being both a priest and a king. And so Yah tells Yahushua or Yahshua ben Yehoshadak, the high priest in Jerusalem in the time of Zechariah in the days of the return from ancient Babylon. He tells him in verse nine, starting in verse nine in chapter six of Zechariah, he says, and the word of Yah came unto me saying, take of them the captivity even of Helda, of Tabijah, and of Jadea, which are come from Babylon, and come thou the same day and go into the house of Yeshia, the son of Zephaniah. Then take silver and gold and make crowns and set them upon the head of Yah Yahshua, the son of Yehoshadak, the high priest, and speak unto them, saying, Thus saith Yahweh of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of Yahweh. Even he shall build the temple of Yahweh. And he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them. Now that means you are saying the greater priest than the priesthood of our Haron's family. That this priest, Yahshua ben Yehoshadak, descended from. That as great a priest as that high priest was, he never was a king. No priest was allowed to be a king. But there's a greater priest that's coming that's both a king and a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And it says in verse 13, even he shall build the temple of Yah and he shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne and he shall be a priest upon his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crowns shall be to Helam and Tobiah and to Jedediah, 
and to him, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of Yah. So Yah said, put a crown on the head of the high priest, Yahshua ben Yehoshadak, and put a crown on the heads of the other priests working with him to illustrate them as models of the coming Melchizedek king priest, Yahshua Hamashiach. And verse 15 says, and they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of Yahweh, and you shall know that Yahweh of hosts have sent me unto you, and it's a kind of path. If you would diligently obey the voice of Yah, your Elohim. So in verses 11 and 14, the priests are given crowns to be a witness of the coming Melchizedek king priesthood of Yahshua the Messiah, who is called the branch in verse 12. So in conclusion, the cleanliness laws regarding the Levitical priests, management of dead relatives in Leviticus chapter 21, verse one through four, was another witness to illustrate as shown in Zechariah chapter three and in chapter six, that the Levitical priests function as signs and wonders of a coming undefiled superior priesthood than theirs, which is the most, Melchizedek king priesthood of Yahshua Hamashiach. Hallelujah. And he has made you, Israel, as it was cited in the book of Revelation, to likewise under his order of priesthood for you to be a, a new priesthood of kings and priests under his order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You represent the government kingdom of Yahshua, the ancient forefathers of the ancient messianic congregation in Jerusalem understood that they represented the place of the throne of the house of David and of the rulership of the true Melchizedek king priest over all Israel, Yahshua HaMashiach. May he rule and reign forever in our lives. I want to show a feature that our dear brother, um, Benaiah Israel, put together. I thought was very inspiring to give us a little bit of clarity and history regarding these matters. Stand by. And of course, our Messiah, Yahshua Hamashiach, or Hamashiach. Along with the 12 apostles, which made up the leadership of the church throughout the entire New Testament, they were all Hebrews, all Israelites. And regarding Yahshua, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 14 reads, For it is evident that our Hamashiach, our Messiah, sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moshe spake nothing concerning the priesthood. Again, from Yahshua to the apostles, they were all Hebrews. They were all Israelites. In fact, throughout the entire New Testament, the leadership team, the head leadership team of the church consisted solely of Hebrews and of Israelites. It wasn't until the fourth century when the leadership team of the church changed dramatically to something never before seen in both the Old or New Testament. In the fourth century, after the death of the Messiah, we have a Roman emperor, Emperor Constantine, become the head or the leadership of the church. For the first time ever, we have a Roman Gentile, seated at the head of the church along with Roman bishops. We also see similar setup in the modern day churches. Modern day churches recognize 
Roman Gentile church fathers such as Martin Luther or John Calvin. This too deviates from the church leadership seen in the New Testament, which was all Hebrews, all Israelites. Once in power, we see these two Roman Gentile led churches openly persecute the Hebrews and the Israelites. In other words, after the Roman Gentiles took over the leadership of the church, the Roman Gentile led church openly persecuted and enslaved and killed the children of Israel. Blessed, beloved Israelites, be blessed. The scripture said in, in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject you, that you should be no priest to me. Seeing you have forgotten the Torah of your Elohim, I will also forget thy children. Yah has been raising you up, Israelites, to be that royal priesthood all along. And if there was any takeaway from the Torah lesson tonight, it's to validate that point. 
your priesthood is the one that the adversary is frightened of more than anything because you serve before the throne of the Most High, the ancient Melchizedek priesthood of Yeshua HaMashiach himself. And this is why it describes in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 19 through, through 26, and the word of Yah came unto Jeremiah saying, Thus saith Yah, if you can break my covenant of the day, my covenant of the night, and that there should be no day and night in that season, then also my covenant be broken with Dawid, my servant, that he should not have a son to rule upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply thy seed, thy weed, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. Moreover, the word of Yah came to Yeremiah, saying, Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, the two families which Yah have chosen, he hath even cast them off, thus they have despised my people that they should be no more a nation before them. Thus saith Yah, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then I will cast away the seed of Yaakov, and thou we my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov. For I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them.